and um, thanks for coming to hear me give this talk on magic for the month of May. It is four o'clock, but I'm going to wait just a moment or two before um, starting the proper talk, just to allow a few people to join in, because usually you get a few people who join a few minutes after the, um, the start of the talk. You can type comments and I should see them, but after the talk started, um, I won't answer any questions until the very end. Just going to wait a few more moments. Right, I can see I've got one person joining in. Should get a few more people. Uh, this is recorded, so if you uh, aren't watching the very beginning of it, uh, you can watch a recording later. I always put it up on YouTube and it stays on Facebook, so you can watch it um, there um, afterwards as well if you missed any of it uh, or if you want to re-watch it. Because I always do give a guided visualisation, or I try to, at the end of the talk and um, you might want to do that again another time so you'll be able to find the recording. Okay, well, um, there's a couple of people here. So I'm just going to start really with the introduction. I always uh, introduce myself at the start of my talks. I'm Lucia Starza. I write a Bad Witches blog and I've written a few Pagan Portals titles for Moon Books. Uh, they are uh, Pagan Portals Guided Visualizations. Everyday Magic, a Pagan Book of Day, so I edited that, it's a community book, it's got entries from about 50 different people. Puppets and Magical Dolls, and Candle Magic, and I've got a book coming out, um, should be in the shops right at the end of the year, it's officially published early next year, called Pagan Portal Scrying, and I'll be giving more information about that at a future Facebook Live talk. Right, okay, I see we've got a few more people joining us. That's great. It's great to see you. Uh, so I'm going to start. Thanks for uh, coming to watch me give this Facebook Live talk on magic for the month of May. Um, now, I am using notes there on my Kindle because it helps me remember what I'm going to say because my memory isn't quite as good as it used to be. It should be about a 40 minute talk, by the way. And as I said before, at the very end of the talk, there's a guide to visualization. So um, if you want to do that later, you can watch the recording. Now, May. May begins with the Festival of Beltane in the modern pagan wheel of the year. Now, many pagans celebrate that on or around May Day, at the very start of May. Others prefer to wait until the hawthorn is in blossom. Hawthorn is known as the May tree. Um, so like the saying, um, shed not a clout till May be out, um, can mean when the May blossom is out. Now I was chatting about um, when to celebrate May Day with um, some friends at the Witches Inn online moot earlier this week. That's run by Becky Bird um, on uh, Facebook. Um, on the first Tuesday of each month usually. It's a really friendly mood. And we were, we were chatting about Beltane and May Day and when we celebrated them. And we were all commenting how the Hawthorn Blossom and the Bluebells are a bit later out this year than usual. Um, now, obviously, what's in bloom in any season will depend on where you are. Now, I live in, um, in southern England in London. Um, and the weather this spring has seemed a little bit colder than usual. I have mentioned on my previous Magic for the Month talks that while the set dates for Wiccan and modern Druidic style Wheel of the Year um, calendar is it, uh, useful if you're arranging large scale events or um, you want to set dates a long way in advance for a Coven meetup or a Druid Grove meetup, if you're celebrating on your own, like many people are this year, uh, and last year, of course, it's often easier to fit in with what's actually happening in nature. 
and I, I've mentioned this several times in my other talks this year but really paying attention to what's actually happening in nature is I think quite important for a nature religion um, so really I think the Beltane energy you can celebrate Beltane you can celebrate the start of May you can welcome summer in when it really feels to you that summer is are coming in as the uh, the song goes you could celebrate this weekend or or even later in the month it's a bit uh, grim and gray out there at the moment you know I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit um more like summer's on its way but i think we've got a little way to go now even for wiccans and people often say oh yes wiccans are very very strict about always celebrating um on the set dates of the wheel of the year calendar but um that's not entirely true uh, when i was training in a garden area in coven many years ago the high priestess maureen brown used to say that if you are uh, writing a seasonal ritual the very first thing you do is you look out of the window and see what's actually happening in nature and better still go out even if that's just going out in the garden go to the local park you don't have to go into the wilds of the countryside if you're living in London but just see what's happening what's in bloom what's on the trees and use that in your ritual if the apple blossom hasn't quite come out yet and it can be a bit late it's only just starting to come out on my tree if that hasn't come out yet then don't go praising the apple blossom on the trees because it's not quite there yet you know maybe the promise of the apple blossom is a better way to word it anyway um what it really means is although we're um the first week into may I'm, I'm going to be talking about may day celebrations beltane and i'm going to start with talking about the spirit of the may queen now uh some years ago but when i was still quite a mature witch I'm not quite a, an old witch as i am now but i was still you know an adult um i got to be the may queen in a right to welcome summer in and that taught me that sometimes dreams come true in strange ways and i'm going to go back to when i was a child now um back in the 1960s when i was a child the town i grew up in always had a may fair and a may queen was chosen to lead the festivities now it was a, a beauty pageant of the kind more popular in the mid 20th century than today now that's a good thing because um, really those kinds of May Queen contests tended to be unintentionally ableist, sizist, ageist and a bit racist. Few in my multicultural working class London suburb were of the physical type likely to actually win the May Queen's crown back then. I, I know things are different now but uh, back then it was quite a stereotyped idea excuse me i'm just going to have a drink of water this as usual i get quite a dry throat when i'm um, talking anyway um yeah a few few in my area were you know it wasn't worthwhile someone like me entering the um the contest as a child um i'd probably have more chance of winning the Wednesday Adams lookalike contest than being the May Queen. So I never entered the May Queen contest, but it didn't stop me dreaming. Now, uh, since then, I've learned that the image of the May Queen, all dressed in white and probably with blonde hair and blue eyes, is a Victorian invention, as are many of our May Day customs. May Day celebrations themselves have been going on for centuries, if not millennia. Steve Roud writes in The English Year, judging by the range of traditional customs that took place on May Day, it was second only to Christmas in popularity with the English people. He goes on to say that the huge range of customs that have evolved since the Middle Ages are so complex and intertwined with regional variations that it's difficult to work out exactly what folk traditions started when. But when it comes to the May Queen, he says, the May Queen is so much a part of England's accepted May Day iconography that we assume it to be an ancient institution. But it is in fact 
almost entirely another 19th century invention. Now that invention comes from things like Tennyson's poem, The May Queen, and um, Washington Irving's sketchbook. Um, Irving claims, the maypole stood from year to year in the center of the village green. On May Day, it was decorated with garlands and streamers and a queen or lady of the May was appointed, as in former times, to preside at the sports and distribute prizes and rewards. Now, um, it sounds genuine enough, but it's probably more fiction than fact. For modern pagans, the May Queen is sometimes a more mythical figure, perhaps an aspect of the goddess. While Victorians envisaged the May Queen as a white dress symbol of virtue and purity, it was common for pagans of recent times to view her more as the leader of orgiastic, um, orgiastic Beltane revels, a symbol of fertility, desire and joyful pleasure, uh, at a time when nature itself is all about the birds and the bees and the drive to reproduce. Now for James Fraser in The Golden Bough, the May Queen was a relic of ancient tree worship. But of course, Fraser's ideas have also fallen out of favour. It probably wasn't true. He um, was a bit fanciful at times. Professor Ronald Hutton, in a recent talk about spring festivals, pointed out that historically it was far too cold in much of England in early May for much outdoor sex. In fact, the register of births from bygone times indicates that people kept their breeches on until the weather warmed up a lot more. But it really doesn't matter whether the idea of the May Queen is ancient or modern, whether she's a symbol of virginal purity or wild desire, or whether she's young or old, a maid or a mother, black or white. In pagan circles, at least, she doesn't have to be portrayed only by willowy girls with blonde hair. Any who feel the call of Maytime can welcome the spirit of the May Queen into their hearts, and if they want to, take the hand of their beloved and dance a summer in. Uh, I'm hoping, of course, that there, in future years, can be a lot more dancing at Maytime. But, of course, you don't have to dance. You can drum, clap, sing. Um, if you don't quite feel up to dancing. Um, inclusive alternatives can always be found to ways of celebrating May. Let's have a little bit more water. Now, on May Day, the foliage clad figure of Jack in the green, accompanied by musicians and people in fancy dress, is now a familiar sight on the streets of London and other towns in southern England in years when we aren't restricted on gatherings in numbers. And there are some great photographs of Jack in the green by Sarah Hannant in the book um, Maypoles, Mama's Maypoles and uh, Milkmaids. I'll uh, show a couple of pictures. It's a, this is a brilliant book of photographs of um, seasonal customs. I'm hoping you can see that okay. We've got a Jack in the Green there, all dressed up in greenery, and um, musicians accompanying him. Now, um, this spring tradition was revived in Deptford in the 1980s by the Blackheath Morris men after seeing a curious photograph of Jack in the Green processions dating from the 1900s. The Morris dancers weren't quite sure what event, um, what the event in the photograph was all about. The only caption on the photo uh, being that it was Fowler's troop Jack in the Green. But it looked fun and suitable for the season so they thought they'd give it a go themselves. It proved very popular and the revived Fowler's Troop and a man dressed up in a wickerwork frame covered in leaves now returns every May the 1st when rules allow it, visiting various pubs in London City and the southern suburbs. Since those early days, folklorists have delved into the history of the tradition to find out a bit more about it. 
Now, at first glance, Jack in the Green bears a striking resemblance to the Green Man, a figure found carved in many old English churches and um, a few churches outside England as well. And it's thought by some to be a relic of pre-Christian nature worship, but the meaning isn't um, absolutely certain. No one knows exactly what the origins of the Green Man are. Um, however, similarities in appearance aside, the current theory is that the tradition of Jack in the Green began only a couple of hundred years ago and developed independently of earlier folklore. So there's no direct connection between Green Men in early churches and Jack in the Green. Fowler's Troop website states, Jack in the Green tradition developed in the 17th century custom of milkmaids going out on May Day with the utensils of their trade, silver cups, pots, spoons, decorated with garlands and piled into a pyramid which they carried on their heads. By the mid 18th century, other groups, uh, notably chimney sweeps, were moving in on the milkmaid's territory as they saw May Day as a good opportunity to collect money. Whatever the origins, it's hard to see Jack in the Green celebrations today and not feel you are witnessing something a little wild and pagan and full of the spirit of Beltane. Other towns also have Jack in the Green events in normal years. And one of the biggest is in Hastings. Um, they have May Day activities taking place all over the bank holiday weekend, sometimes a few days either side. That includes the crowning of a May Queen, Morris dancing, live music, and the release and symbolic slaying of, of Jack to set free the spirit of summer. Obviously, no real people are harmed in the slaying. So now I'm going to talk about Jill in the Green. So why shouldn't there be a Jill in the Green as well as a Jack in the Green? That's what I thought. So um, anyway, this year I've been doing a lot of solitary seasonal celebrations, as a lot of people have. Um, and I decided to create a Jill in the Green as a floral picture made from flowers, leaves, twigs and catkins from my garden. Now, um, I, I don't think these days we should be too strict on gender when creating people in the green. You might have seen the picture on my blog. I have posted it on my blog a few times, but I will show it now. I, there you go. Uh, there is my Jill in the green. So, from a Jill in the green or made of flowers, I'm going to talk about flowers that bloom in May. Now, uh, my flower beds are always full of forget-me-nots at this time of year, and I've uh, got a little sprig. You might see I've also got some behind me. They don't actually last very well indoors, but I, I put some in water and brought them inside. Now, the little blue flowers mean true love, according to The Language of Flowers by Margaret Pixton. It was a very popular book in Victorian times. You know, you'd give someone a bunch of flowers and the, the, the symbolic meaning of the flowers was the message that that bunch gave. Uh, another book, The Meaning of Flowers, Folklore, Fairy Law, Superstitions and Remedies by Cecily Mary Barker, gives a sadder um, meaning. Uh, she tells of an Austrian folk story where two lovers, a girl and a boy, were walking beside the Danube. The girl pointed to some blue flowers being swept along by the fast flowing river and wished she could have them. In the name of love, the boy jumped in to get them for his sweetheart, but sadly there were very um, uh, uh, fast flowing currents and uh, he threw the sprig of blooms onto the, um, onto the shore, um, but the currents carried him off and he shouted, forget me not, as he was sadly drowned. The book goes on to say that forget-me-nots are fairy flowers and can be used to help find fairy treasure. Now, I don't think that means that fairies plant forget-me-nots wherever they've buried um, treasure, because the flowers grow just about everywhere. And if that was the case, either the fairies have huge amounts of treasure uh, and I would find it when I weeded my garden, probably, which I don't. I've never found any treasure in my garden. Um, or else they also plant lots of forget-me-nots as decoys, and let's face it, that would rather defeat the object. Primroses are another spring flower associated with finding fairy treasure. 
and both are sometimes called key flowers so like having them holding them can enable you to see through fairy illusions John Fiske, in his book Myths and Mythmakers, Old Tales and Superstitions, interpreted by comparative mythology, suggests that a wearing of um, a sprig of forget-me-nots in your hat can help you see past illusions. And he tells a tale of a man travelling alone on a mountain who picks a blue flower to wear on his hat. He instantly sees an iron door in the mountainside, which was not apparent before. It opens to a lighted passage leading to a magnificent hall steeped with gems. The traveller fills his pockets, then greedily also fills his hat, uh, not noticing as he turns it upside down that the flower has fallen from the band. As he leaves, the little flower calls, forget me not. He looks around at the sound, but doesn't notice the tiny blue petals among the glittering jewels. So he leaves without it, but without the magical flower, he becomes hopelessly lost, doomed to wandering the lonely mountains with nothing to guide his way. Now, to be honest, if you do find fairy gold, you would be really advised to leave it alone, as fairies are not reputed to take kindly to humans stealing their stuff in any folk tale I've heard of. But if you find, if you fail to find fairy gold, you might get a new frock. According to a book called Kentucky Superstitions, if you swallow the first forget-me-not of the season, you will get a new dress of the same colour. I haven't tried it. I don't know what they taste like. I actually don't even know if forget-me-nots are edible, so don't take that as advice. Now, daisies. A daisy spell for, coming, for overcoming indecision. Uh, a little bit of uh, spring magic. Daisies might not be exclusively a May flower, but there's always a lot of them in my lawn at this time. So here's a daisy spell for overcoming indecision. It's based on the game where you pick a daisy and then say, he loves me, then he loves me not. Alternatively, as you pick off a petal of the time, the idea is that the final petal will give you the true answer to a question about love. Well, we might all have questions about love, but many of us have um, choices to make and dilemmas. And here's a little spell that adapts the daisy game to help you make your mind up when faced with all sorts of indecisions. And for the spell, I've combined the daisy game with the words from another rhyme, the old musical song, Daisy, Daisy, Give Me Your Answer Do. I won't sing it. Um, you don't want to hear me sing. But I will say the words from the rhyme from the, uh, the song. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy all for the love of you. It won't be a stylish marriage. I can't afford a carriage, but you'd look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle made for two. Now, here's what you do in the daisy spell for overcoming indecision. First, pick your daisy. Then think about the matter you are in a dilemma about. And thinking about that, say, Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy, not knowing what to choose. Then you pull off one petal at a time and ask, should I do this? Thinking about one thing. As you pack off one petal, then should I do that? As you pluck the next. Do this slowly and visualise each of the options as clearly as you can as you do it. When you get to the last petal, you should have a possible answer to your question. Now, in the traditional divination game, whatever the last petal represents is the correct answer. But for this spell, you will know the answer more correctly by how you feel about it. The daisy is simply helping you to tap into your own intuition. It's quite possible that you will know that the answer the daisy gave you is the right one. But if you have a very strong feeling that the daisy's answer is not right for you at this time, trust that your intuition is giving you good advice. Just another sip of water. Now bluebells. For me, bluebells are the quintessential Mayflower. At a Beltane celebration a couple of years ago, talking with some witchy friends about traditional May Day songs, one we remembered was 
in and out the dusty bluebells, but we all had slightly different versions of the words. Three lines repeat, in and out the dusty bluebells. I recall the last line of the first verse being, you would be my partner. But other versions seem to be, you would be my master, or you are my master, and, and one person remembered as being my fair lady. The second verse starts with three lines of either tippy tippy tap toe on your shoulder or give a little pet pat on her shoulder and then the same variations for the last line of the second verse as the first. Now we all remember there's a dance that went with it in which people stand in a circle, one person skips in and out between them for the first verse and stands behind one person patting on their shoulder or singing the second verse. The first verse is repeated with both people holding hands and skipping in out of the first of the circle, picking a third person to join in, and then a fourth, and so on until everyone's dancing. None of us could remember what the origins of the song were supposed to be, so I did a bit of web searching. It seems that one idea is that the song originates from the 1900s, or perhaps a little earlier, and refers to May hiring fairs when young people were selected by farmers to work for the summer. It was a time that bluebells were flowering, hence the dusty bluebells, and the reference to getting a master was about gaining employment. Now, I must admit I'd hoped that it was a bit more romantic, um, but um, whatever it might have meant in the past, nowadays the song seems to be more about celebrating the beauty of the bluebells and perhaps a little nostalgia for times gone by. Now, in England, there are two species of bluebells. There's native British bluebells and non-native Spanish bluebells. And cross-breeding between the two means British bluebells are sadly dying out. Bluebells have grown in my garden ever since I was a child. And I'm pretty sure that at one time they were um, and the, uh, the English type. Now, over the years, I guess they've become hybridized. I haven't brought any into the house as that's considered unlucky. Now, if you want to spot the difference between Spanish bluebells and English bluebells, the Woodland Trust website tells you how to. Now, native English bluebells have creamy white coloured pollen, deep violet blue petals, sometimes white. The flower stems droop or nod to one side, and almost all the flowers are on one side of the stem, hanging down one side. The flowers are narrow, straight-sided bell with parallel sides, and the petal tips are reflexed or curl back. The flowers have a strong, sweet scent, and the Spanish bluebells actually have green or blue pollen, pale to mid-blue petals, sometimes white or pink. The flower stem is stiff and upright. The flowers are all the way round with the flowers sticking out, and the flowers are wide open like a cone-shaped bell and the petal tips flesh slightly outwards, and they often have no scent at all. If I lived in an area where native bluebells grew, I would remove my hybrids. But as I live in London, where most bluebells are like mine, removing them would only deprive the bees of flowers that um, I can see they love, and it would deprive me of my, one of my favourite garden flowers. Although obviously that should be a small, um, a small consideration, you know, the environment should really come first. Um, it wouldn't really, as I said, it wouldn't really make a difference because pretty much all of the bluebells in southern in in England, in southern England, well, no, there are quite a lot of bluebell woods in, in Sussex that I know of that do have native bluebells, but certainly in London, most of them are hybridised, so it would make little difference. Now, here's another little bit of folklore. You should always tiptoe gently through the bluebells, for if you shake one, it will ring out with only a sound that fairies can hear. And if you wade through a mass of bluebells on the woodland floor, you could summon an angry mob of fairies, and um, you, they don't want to be disturbed, and it's probably not a good idea. Well, um, to be honest, that's good advice even if you don't believe in fairies. Bluebells suffer badly from being trampled on. In heavily trodden places, next year's plants will be sparse and straggly, and picking the plants can also weaken them. So it is a good idea to leave bluebells alone and stick to the path if you go for a bluebell walk.
just a little bit more water. Now, um, moving on further into May, um, 15th of May is the Ides of May. And on this day, the Vestal Virgins of ancient Rome performed a rite to ensure the supply of water for the coming year. Part of the ceremony performed by the Vestal Virgins to ensure ancient Rome's water supply involved throwing 24 doll-like mannequins into the River Tiber. These were small effigies made of straw. And one idea is that they may have replaced an earlier offering of human sacrifice. Now, um, these days I wouldn't recommend throwing anything into a river that might cause pollution or block the flow of a watercourse. But if you wanted to do a similar kind of ritual, what you could do is cut 24 tiny person shapes out of something that ducks like to eat. Now, um, I believe lettuce would work fine, as lettuce is recommended as suitable duck food. You could use a gingerbread cutter to cut out a template and um, go to your local park that allows duck feeding to uh, do a little ritual to ask for a water supply, um, a, 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 a good supply of water on the watercourses there. With climate change meaning more years of drought and more years of flood, as well as plastic polluting our seas and rivers and other environmental issues relating to water supplies, you could incorporate this into a modern pagan rite to protect our waters. And it would be an auspicious time to look at we, what we can do to conserve water, like perhaps buying a water butt. You could take part in a, a beach cleaning or a riverbank cleaning um, and incorporate that into a rite as well. Now, I do know that most pagans are aware of environmental issues, so I don't really want to get too preachy over that. Now, I'm going to now offer a guided visualisation on the theme of exploring a bluebell wood. I've written this especially for this month's um, Magic for the Month talk, and it follows the themes of the rest of this talk and is about going into a bluebell wood and encountering a magical being who offers choices. Guided visualisations are journeys we make in our minds using a script created to help us experience a story that we're part of. Now, if you want to do this guided visualisation, make sure you're in a safe and comfortable place where you won't be disturbed. If you aren't anywhere suitable or don't feel it would be right for you at the moment, then you can just listen to it as you would a story, but not actually try to visualise it. Don't do a guided visualisation if uh, you're doing something where uh, you shouldn't close your eyes or, or you could get distracted. Ideally, guided visualisations are best done with the eyes closed, so first I'll ask you to take a few deep breaths, relax and close your eyes. And at points in the narrative, I'll pause to let you continue the story to yourself in your own way. That might be to visualise things as a picture in your mind's eye, or it might just be to, visual, uh, to imagine the words of the story. Uh, everyone's different in the way they uh, uh, visualise things. Right, so I'm going to take a sip of water and give you a little bit of an opportunity to get comfortable if you want to join in. Okay, so if you're ready, let's begin. Sit comfortably and close your eyes. Take three deep breaths in and out. In and out, in and out, and relax. Visualize the following. Visualize that you are out in nature, in a beautiful place in the countryside, just on the edge of a bluebell wood on a sunny spring morning in May. There's no other human being around but yourself. You feel safe and comfortable and at peace. Looking around, you spot a pathway leading into the wood and you decide to follow it. You make your way along the path which winds through the trees 
the woodland trees are coming into leaf. So above you is a new canopy of bright green, while on the ground, on either side of the path, is a carpet of bluebells as far as you can see. It is beautiful and peaceful and you feel completely safe as you follow the path. Visualise moving along the path through the wood. What do you see around you? What do you hear? What do you smell? Spend some time enjoying the sights and sounds and scents as you continue along the safe path further into the wood. After a while, the path turns and enters a grassy clearing in the wood. The grass in the clearing is fresh and lush and dotted with wild flowers. In the centre of the clearing is a well. The well looks old and is surrounded by a low circular wall. You see four chalices on the edge of the wall. You enter the clearing and get closer to the well. You look at the chalices and see that they are empty. You look into the well and see that the water height is such that you could reach in with any of the chalices and scoop up a cup of water. The water looks cool and inviting. It smells fresh. You realise that you are thirsty after your walk on this beautiful day. But before you can take any further action, you see the surface of the water shimmer and you hear a voice that seems to be coming from within the well. I am the spirit of the well, says the voice. And these waters offer many things, but only if you drink after choosing one of these cups. Look at each cup in turn and I will tell you what magic it offers. Remember, you can only choose one cup from which to drink. You examine the first cup. The voice speaks. If you draw up water with this cup, it will give you the strength to make a difference in the world, to help heal or do good for the planet. Study this cup well. Consider what you might do with this gift and remember it. Spend a little time looking at the cup, examining it and considering what it offers. The voice then speaks again and instructs you to look at the second cup. You do so and the voice speaks once more. If you draw water from the well and drink from the second cup, it will grant you a wish for something you personally desire. Think carefully about what you want and what that might mean before you drink if you choose this cup. Spend a little time looking at the second cup, examining it and considering what it offers. The voice then speaks again and instructs you to look at the third cup. 
you do so, and then the voice speaks once more. If you use this third cup to draw water from the well, your thirst will be quenched and you will be refreshed, but that is all. Nothing else will change. Sometimes treading lightly on the earth is the best course of action. Consider whether this is the cup you would drink from. Spend some time looking at the third cup, examining it and considering what it offers. The voice then speaks again and instructs you to look at the fourth and final cup. You do so and the voice speaks out once more. The fourth cup offers self-knowledge. This is of value to any who walk a spiritual path. But be aware that self-knowledge is not always comfortable. Consider whether this is the cup you would drink from. Spend a little time looking at the fourth and last cup, examining it and considering what it offers. The voice then speaks again. Now, if you would drink from the well, choose which cup you will do use to draw up water and which gift you wish to have. Spend a little while making your final decision, whether to drink from the first cup of strength to make a difference in the world, the second cup for something you desire, the third cup offering only refreshment, or the fourth and final cup offering self-knowledge. And of course, you always have also have a fifth choice to drink from none of these. Now make your decision. Take whichever cup you choose. Dip it into the well to fill with water and drink from it if you wish. The water is pure, cool and refreshing. As you finish drinking, the cup in your hand vanishes, as do all the other cups. The voice then speaks again. You have made your choice and acted accordingly. Remember that whatever choices and actions we make in life affects what happens in the future. Even our inaction can affect what happens. Change is not always obvious and it can be slow, but what we do or don't do can make a difference. The voice finishes and you hear it no more. The well is still there with its low wall in this grassy glade in the wood, but there is no longer a shimmer in the water. You hear only the natural sounds of the wood around you, the song of the birds and the rustling of the leaves. However, you feel that the choice you made be something to ponder in the times ahead. You retreat from the glade and return along the path through the bluebell wood. You safely reach the edge of the wood and you look around once more at the beautiful countryside on this spring morning. Then you realise it is time to return to your normal reality. When you are ready, take a deep breath, shake your fingers and toes and open your eyes to the real world. Now that's the end of the visualisation. 
I do hope that was good for those who took part. Um, after you've done any magical work or done a guided visualization, you could should ground to make sure you're fully back to reality. And the best way to do that is to have something to eat or drink. If that's not possible, then perhaps stamp your feet on the ground or, um, you know, grip the chair or table strongly. Um, now that's the end of my talk on magic for the month of May. Um, if you're watching this live and have any questions, you can leave a comment. That would be great. I'd love to hear if you um, if you enjoyed it or if you um, want to discuss anything that you saw in the visualisation. Uh, it can take a little while for uh, comments to appear. Um, so while I'm waiting to see if there are any comments, I will going to give another plug for my books. Um, yep, we got Candle Magic, Poppets and Magical Dolls, Everyday Magic and Guided Visualizations. And of course, there's my blog, which you can follow. I will be putting a link to this on my blog as well. That's at www.badwitch.co.uk. Now, in June, I'm going to be giving a live online talk at MoonCon 21, which runs from Saturday the 5th to Sunday the 6th of June. And that's been put on by my publisher, Moon Books. Now, MoonCon 21 is two days of online talks, panels and a Q&A uh, live sessions with a, a host of Moon Books authors. I'm going to be giving a talk at 3 p.m. UK time on the 5th of June. The event starts at 10 a.m. UK time. It's completely free and you can find out more about it. If you go to the Moon Books Facebook page, um, you can find out a lot more about it. And I've also got the details and the links on my own blog events page. Now, um, I'm going to stay around to see if any any questions. I'm not actually seeing any questions this time. That's fine. Um, uh, I will be, this will be, uh, recorded so uh, you can uh, if you've got any other questions about it you can uh, contact me via my um, via Facebook um, or there is a contact page on my on my blog at the top you I've got a contacts page and there's various other ways of contacting me okay right well if there's no questions I am gonna end this video I'm gonna thank you all very very much for uh, attending and to listening to me and hope to see you again next month.